What is Missing in Colombia? William Ospina. Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in Hervio, a municipality in the department of Tolima. What is Missing in Colombia? One of the most indisputable truths of our tradition is that Colombian society is founded on the example of the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man, as well as on its ideals of freedom, equality, and fraternity. When the 200th anniversary of that revolution was recently celebrated, many reminded us how intensely we come from it and our children of its example. However, I believe that if Colombian society and the apparatus of its institutions demonstrate anything, it is that no one comes from a distant revolution and no one can simply be the son of its example. You live a revolution or you don't live it, and the pretense of inheriting its emblems without having participated in the mental and social dynamics that gave it life, without having won its victories or suffered its sufferings, is nothing more than a resounding imposture. Our history is usually characterized by that tendency to think that it is enough to repeat with rapture the words that expressed an era in order to participate in it. It is enough for us to shout liberté, égalité, and fraternite, so that luminous freedom, generous equality, noble brotherhood reign among us, so that we have already made our revolution. But in reality we rush to utter those cries to prevent that revolution from coming and to pretend that we have already made it. 180 years after its independence from the Spanish Empire, Colombia is a society prior to the French Revolution, prior to the Enlightenment and prior to the Protestant Reformation. Under the guise of a liberal republic, it is a colonized stately society, ashamed of itself and hesitant to take on the challenge of knowing itself, of recognizing itself, and of attempting institutions that are born from its own social composition. Since the discovery of America, Colombia has been a society incapable of charting its own destiny, it has officiated at the altars of several planetary powers, it has tried to imitate their cultures, and the only culture in which it has radically refused to recognize itself is its own. Own, in that of its indigenous people, its criollos, its blacks, its mulattoes, and its growing miscegenations. It has also refused, after the magnificent experience of the botanical expedition was drowned in blood, to recognize itself in its nature. For this reason, he is now paying the consequences of his unheard of lack of character. It has allowed other peoples to impose a social and ethical interpretation of some of its natural wealth. It has assumed the passive and miserable role of witness to how the logic of industrial society transforms, for example, the coca leaf into cocaine, consumes it frantically, irrigates the veins of its economy with its trade, and finally declares the countries that cultivate it, process it, and sell it as the true responsible for the fact and the only ones who must correct it. Thus, a problem that compromises the crisis of civilization, the inability of modern societies to offer serenity and happiness to their crowds, the ethical emptiness of a declining age, and the growing need of this time to stun oneself with spectacles and substances. Increasingly exciting, it is turned by irresponsible governments and unscrupulous empires into a police problem, and it is always the servile peripheral countries that get involved that end up being demonized by the imperial finger. This is because it is a fundamental law of all power that the fault always lies with others, and above all with the weak. The reason why human beings have such a hard time finding the causes of evil is because the last thing we do is look at our hearts. We always look into the heart of the neighbor to find the guilty, and we are stunned with the infinite presumption of our own innocence. This is how the empire works. It incites, pays for, consumes, produces processing substances, polishes procedures, develops marketing methods, sustains immense state apparatuses dedicated to instigating trafficking in order to learn about it and be able to repress it, allows legions of officials to debase themselves and betray themselves in the name of the country and the community, sacralizes degrading and disgusting practices under the old banner that the end justifies the means, and finally declares himself innocent of a conspiracy and calls for the crusade of the pure against the demons. But what happens in the field of international relations, and which repeats what has always happened in the unequal relations between the country and others, is just one of the frameworks in which the incredible reality of our country moves. 
How do you sustain a society in which everyone knows that practically nothing works? From the public telephones that are not good for making calls to the bridges that are not good for being used and the public officials that are not good for attending to people and the armed forces that are not good for defending the lives of citizens and the judges that are not used to judge and governments that are not used to govern and laws that are not used to be obeyed. The spectacle that Colombia would offer to a hypothetical well-intentioned and sensible observer would be amusing if it were not for the pool of blood in which it rests. Any Colombian knows, nothing here serves a public purpose. Here there are only private interests. The Colombian only conceives of personal relationships, he only conceives of his limited personal or family interest, and to that sole purpose he subordinates all his public and private activity. Words like homeland cause laughter in Colombia, and the only beings who believe in them, the soldiers who march singing to the war camps, are innocent victims who can only do for their homeland and die for it. All the others have set up a private business. And the most amazing thing is that the state itself is the private business of those who administer it at almost all levels. Woe to anyone who tries to moralize or set an example in such a cesspool of appetites. Woe to the official who tries to work efficiently, when all the others derive their security from a kind of tacit agreement to hinder everything and to allow the state to be nothing more than an organism that perpetuates disorder and social inefficiency. Of the Colombian state it can be said that it presents two absolutely contradictory characteristics. That is, it is a state that does not exist at all, and it is a state that exists infinitely. If it is about fulfilling the functions that universally correspond to the states, provide social security, provide protection to the citizen, guarantee health, education, public cleanliness, equality before the law, work, the dignity of individuals recognize the merits and punish the faults, the state does not exist at all. But when it comes to vile things, looting the public treasury, running over the citizenry, persecuting street vendors, evicting the homeless, profiting from the community's assets and, above all, guaranteeing privileges, the state exists infinitely. Nothing has ever been seen more helpful to the powerful and more grown up with the humble than the Colombian state. And why? Because for a long time the state in Colombia has been simply an instrument to allow a narrow band of powerful people to own the country, to open up all opportunities and pave all paths for them, and at the same time to be the wall that prevents any social advancement. All transformation, all really generous sensitivity. The Colombian state is an absolutely anti-popular, stately, oppressive, and petty state, made to keep the great majority of the population in prostration and indignity. There is neither greatness nor true national spirit in him. Before, to verify this, one had to go to see how the towns of the Pacific coast, the towns of the interior of Bolivar, the agricultural regions, the lost villages remain abandoned, now it is enough to walk the central streets of the capital, now there is not a single field of reality in which we can say that the state is helping the nation, is formulating a purpose, is building a country. But where are the highways, where are the bridges, where are the railways, where are the shipyards, where are the ports, where is justice, where is social security, where is agriculture, where is employment, where is the security of the fields, where is the work of the state? Is this robbery, this meanness, this irresponsibility in all fields of life, the state to which we must bow down, and which we cannot criticize because we would be accused of attacking the institutions? I was taught as a child that all tyranny is disguised with the mask of respectability, but that it is easy to know when a nation is in the hands of a tyrant. If no one can expect solutions from him, if the entire country loses hope, if people are afraid to demand, to criticize, to fail. If impunity and misery reign, if the countryside is in the hands of the guerrillas, the cities in the hands of criminals, the economy in the hands of traffickers and relations with the world in the hands of the delegates of the empire, is that a nation state? Is it not rather the shameful tyranny of a caste of irresponsible bureaucrats dedicated to flattering each other, the choreography of reciprocal bows of all the agents of corruption? Where is the immense national wealth that the specialized economic newspapers proclaim? Why does it benefit the community as a whole so little? 
What masquerade is this to which we give the name of institutions? But the most serious thing about all this, or perhaps the only serious thing, is not that we do not know where the great works, the great purposes, or the great examples are. The serious thing is that we do not know where the immense country that suffers from these political miseries is. No one complains, no one rebels. No one comes out in defense of the legitimate right to indignation. No one comes to repeat to us that Colombia was a great nation and that it was founded on great ideals. The town is silent. That he is poor, we know from the statistics. That he is out of work, we know from the statistics. That he has no protection, we know from the statistics. But where are those who claim, those who assert themselves, those who demand? Where are even those who ask? Nothing is heard. Silence and mist. Breaths of the arcane. The light lies, the song lies. Only the rumor of a vague vain wind flying on the sails expires. What the poet heard fifty years ago is what we continue to hear. But if no one complains, then isn't all this invective a disproportionate injustice? Could it be that there is indeed an effort by the state to fulfill its duty and that is why the citizenry is silent and waits? Aren't the big newspapers right when they say that this is an exemplary and patient people that knows how to understand the efforts of the ruling class to educate it, to cultivate it, to tidy it up? The ignorant mob may not deserve much, but apparently they know how to be grateful. He does not rebel, he does not even ask, he simply waits with exemplary patience for the reward of such a long wait to fall into his hands one day. But the truth is that the people expect nothing. Or better said, don't even wait. Colombia, it must be said, has a sad characteristic, it is a country that has become accustomed to begging, and this means, it is a country that has renounced dignity. There are not only beggars in the streets, the state wants to accuse Tom citizens to beg. The state, for example, does not fulfill its functions. He has no money, he says, since citizens do not pay taxes as they should. However, citizens do not pay taxes as they should because the state does not invest but embezzles funds, wastes and steals. Thus the irremediable circle is closed. But since the state does not comply, here are the individuals. The private company, for example, is going to do us the favor of helping people. Sometimes companies' charitable missions come to the depressed communes, to the abandoned coastlines, to the lost towns to do what the state did not do. On the one hand, of course, all these philanthropic missions obtain exemptions and recognition from the state. But society also owes gratitude to these generous apostles of the public interest. What's wrong with that? That we are used to receiving and thanking as alms what is owed to us by right. Thus, life becomes a miracle only possible through the philanthropy of a few, and society is never made up of free and haughty individuals, of worthy and enterprising beings who feel they have the right to demand, who feel they are spokespersons of the national will, but by submissive and grateful beggars. But the state itself is constantly begging, and only in this area does it assume its function of setting an example. If there is a catastrophe, an earthquake, say, and in a medium-sized city ten buildings collapse, we can be sure that when the head of the disaster office is interviewed about what is being done to respond to the problem, the official will say, we are already asking international organizations for help. How? A country that is not capable of rebuilding ten collapsed buildings. A country that first thinks of begging planetary organisms for alms. That is the example of our state. While inside here the officials and contractors fly with taxpayers' money, let the international organizations rebuild our buildings. And so spreads the most dangerous, the most discouraging, the most numbing of the nation's ills, the indignity, the lack of pride, the terrifying lack of character that eats away at the country and of which almost all of our rulers are notable exponents. Sometimes their memory may fail them, sometimes their responsibility may fail them, sometimes their ethics may fail them, always, at the moment when it is most needed, their character fails them. And in that they only show that they are as Colombian as the rest, 
because if our country lacks something, it is character. That is why we do not trust ourselves, that is why we do not feel in good hands when we are in the hands of our countrymen, that is why we do not buy what we produce and that is why we only value what others produce, that is why we hardly invent anything, and the sometimes we never value what we invent. But are we guilty of not having character? And in what is it revealed that we lack it? In the first place, when something has become so much our own, it is already necessary to assume it as a destiny, and in the face of this, it is only possible to face it or change it. We cannot take refuge under the pretext that we are not the cause of our ills, that we are children of history. If we are children of history, history has taught that it can take sudden turns moved by the collective will to change. But why change? That is where it is necessary to undress the danger of the lack of character. For example, a nurse makes a mistake in administering medicine. If he has character, he will be able to face responsibility for his mistake, he will sound the alarm, he will say, I was wrong, I accept my fault, but let's do something, let's not allow this person to die. If he has no character, he will try to prevent others from finding out about the mistake, and with it he will produce a chain of horrible events. Later, the director of the clinic, with his corresponding lack of character, instead of accepting the fact, will hide the error for three days, will deny to the media that it has occurred, and we will all feel that this is a country in which we cannot trust anyone. This will occur in all fields of life, and we will end up feeling that we are in the hands of irresponsible and foolish people who do not have the courage and integrity to take on difficulties and resolve them gallantly and with respect for others. That's why here, every time someone makes a mistake, he roars at his victim, so that he doesn't think he will show the weakness of assuming the mistake. And if the other complains, he will become aggressive. Much of our aggressiveness is weakness and stupidity. Just as our cruelty corresponds to a painful lack of imagination. Have we then no virtue? I think we have many. But the truth is that we will only notice them when we recognize our shortcomings. One of them is simulation. It is a defect that is born of the feeling of inferiority. The young lady who travels to Miami feels that because she is Colombian she is naturally inferior to North Americans. So when she returns she will try to show that her trip has shortchanged her into a foreigner, or lightened her shameful Creole condition. It will then pretend to belong to that illustrious tradition. Thus, this simulation, this imposture, which seems arrogance, is an act of servility and ridiculous humility. This is what happens when Creole advertisers talk to each other in English to dazzle each other, when young people try to impress themselves with the brands of the clothes they wear. All authenticity is considered a shortage, because you have a deep feeling of unworthiness and smallness, so you have to affirm yourself in the marks, in the poses, in the symbols. The young man who spends a few months in France will arrive visibly methodical, the one who spends a few in Germany will arrive severely systematic, and this in principle does not show learning ability or mental hospitality but the same old weakness of character. The one that makes television commercials full of people with fine features and clear eyes, because the mestizos who have always run the country remain ashamed of their faces, their language, their spirit, only the physiognomies sacralized by a servile aesthetic, only the tastes inherited by our traditional lack of originality, can be expressed. Thus we continue to play the game that we are exclusively a white, Catholic, and liberal nation, even though our cities are the most notable example of miscegenation and mulatto edge on the continent, although our religious life is the most amazing combination of spiritualism, santeria, witchcraft, animaism, and hypocrisy that can be found, although our political life is characterized by the fact that the President of the Republic is elected by 10% of the population, exactly the same percentage who lives directly or indirectly from the state. From very early on in our country there was this tendency to exclude and disqualify others, which has brought us to the heights of intolerance and social hostility that we suffer today. A Colombian hardly recognizes himself in another without a long series of checks of an ethnic, economic, political, social and family nature, if you don't do a thorough exploration of where you work, 
the neighborhood you live in, the clothes you wear, and the people you meet. And of course this hostility is not only from the rich towards the poor, the latter in turn feel the discomfort of relating to people who belong to another world, and they do not stop expressing the displeasure caused by the ritual of simulations that characterizes life. Society of the Other Classes The stately contempt for the humble has one of its greatest strongholds in this country. Many would believe that this is a universal phenomenon, but it is enough to visit other countries to understand that in them certain principles of democracy are realities, not perfect of course, but much closer to the ideal that democracy suggests. Countries without extreme conditions of misery, countries that respect human work, value it and reward it, countries that do not allow themselves the indignity of having their streets infested with beggars, countries that do not allow themselves the degrading spectacle of having people on the streets who they feed on garbage. Because there the absurdity and insignificance of our courtly heirs are naked. While in North America it is simply said the White House, to refer to the most powerful center of government on the planet, in this country the seat of government is still called palace, as we learned to say it since the days when the shadow of the Escorial gave gloom to our souls. And the governments do not feel ashamed that El Palacio is a few meters from the last well of human misery, La Calle del Carducho where numerous human beings of those that are insensitivity called disposable. But perhaps what the governments want is to be seen in that symbol, power and scum coexisting in the same neighborhood, the caricature fullness of our institutions. Traditionally, countries achieve an identification with themselves based on feeling that they are members of the same ethnic group, of the same tradition, based on the evidence of affinities. But the main characteristic of the modernity inaugurated by the discovery of America is the convergence on each territory of the greatest ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity imaginable. Empires have always been victims of a profound contradiction. They seek to unify the world under a single power, but in this effort they tear particular cultures from their isolated niches and put them in contact with others. The result is not usually the dissolution of nations and tribes under the influence of official culture, but rather an exacerbation of nationalism. The Roman Empire failed in the attempt to unite humanity, following Alexander's motto, one empire under one god. Local cultures never cease to exist, and today, 20 centuries later, Europe is a continent as divided into particular cultures, traditions, and languages, as it was when the empire tried to prevail. Finally the arrogant power of the emperors and the patricians succumbed to the migrations that the same power of Rome aroused. The splendid and turbulent capital became a magnetic center that attracted men and women from all corners, and this siege of the shores against the center of the empire is what we call its decline and fall. Something similar is happening today. The great contemporary empire, by exalting its model of life as a universal law, cannot prevent the credulous crowds of the planet from rushing towards the center attracted by the irresistible magnet. But the hordes of immigrants do not come to submit to the paradigms of civilization, they come eager to take advantage of its advantages without giving up their national peculiarities. Immigrants to the North American territory, for example, once sought to be Americans, to forget in the splendor of their new condition the hardships of their old homelands, the persecution and poverty. America was the kingdom of hope. Today no one ignores that the poor of the world arrive there, not because they are disappointed in their homelands of origin, which they carry more and more ardent in their hearts, but because they are driven by necessity. America is no longer a kingdom of hope but a kingdom of despair. It is not surprising that immigrants take advantage of the new world but feel that they belong more and more to the small country from which they come, and this is even stronger because modern communications allow them to have almost daily contact with their origins. Colombia was incorporated into modernity by the discovery, and it would be difficult to find a nation that brings together so many contradictions typical of our time. The conflict between the native peoples and the invading peoples is in it from the beginning. As this conflict did not lead to an extermination of the native population in the manner of North America, a third element in conflict arose, miscegenation, which, being the offspring of races that repelled and disqualified each other, did not become a synthesis but a new contender, 
incapable of identifying with himself and who always sought in the distant and in the illustrious his justification and his language. There are also the Afro-American peoples, whose parents arrived as foreigners and slaves. Their current children, theoretically freed from slavery, continue to be regarded as foreigners by the rest of society, and have not yet undertaken a great takeover of the world to which they inalienably belong. But in addition to ethnic conflicts, emphatically denied by the establishment although they are obvious in a thousand different ways in daily life, a deeper conflict is that between the economic and political elites and the rest of society, discriminated against by their poverty and excluded from all opportunity. Added to this is the fact that starting in the 1940s, a colossal process of peasant exodus to the cities began, fleeing ruthless rural violence, a process that in less than half a century inverted the proportions of urban population and population peasant. This would not be so serious if it were not for the fact that this small urban sector, led by the arrogant capital of the republic, was deeply ashamed of the country to which it belonged, and received the peasants with truly disgraceful incomprehension, hostility, and inhumanity. The peasants came from a long-established culture. They had a wisdom in their relationship with the land, a language full of grace, in which roughness and tenderness found an eloquent and lively expression. They were dignified and serene beings incorporated into a profound and profitable relationship with the world. Overnight, these beings were swept away by a furious wind that tore them from the ancient steadiness of their universe and cast them defenseless into an unforgiving world. His simplicity was received as ignorance, his nobility as stupidity, his elemental wisdom as dullness. It is impossible to describe how many ways the vast masses of expelled peasants suddenly found themselves foreigners in their own homeland, and the label mountaineer became the stigma with which Colombia turned its back on its past and abandoned its their children in the hands of the prejudices of modernity. Suddenly the country of simulation, unable to build something of its own in which to recognize itself, discovered the paradigms of progress only to use them against itself, and bowed as always, without criteria, without character, without reflection and without memory, to the dictates of a hypothetical superior world. The main characteristic of the Colombian ruling classes has not been wickedness, cruelty, or lack of nobility, but fundamentally stupidity. Or, rather, it is from this stupidity that all other evils spring like hydra heads. In all the countries of the world there are rich and poor, there are people favored by fortune and people abandoned by it. But the ruling classes of the great world not only assumed their patriotic duties early, identified themselves with the reality to which they belonged and admitted a principle of dignity in the multitudes of their nations, but also tried to be consistent. When they founded institutions based on elementary principles of equality of opportunity and respect for human dignity, they tried to at least be faithful to those principles. Something taught them that one cannot allow misery and indignity to proliferate with impunity. To this, the ethics of some religions that felt responsible for their faithful contributed in many places, an ethics that compromised conduct, while it is already known that the religious ethics of our nation is surprisingly based on the criterion that he who sins and pray empata, and suggests that religious life does not consist in doing well but in repenting in time. Here the people feel that they are fulfilling their religious duties not if they are noble and generous with others, in accordance with the precept of Christ, but if they comply with the liturgy. To be saved, it was not necessary to comply with humanity, it was enough to comply with the church. From early on, poverty was allowed to proliferate here, because those beings of other races and other cultures did not deserve the respect and care of the good people, and they were hardly worthy of charity. That is why since colonial times there have been gamins in Bogota, and it is significant that even to name them they have resorted to the imposture of another language. Calling them that, French style, not only legitimized their existence, but also established a cultural distance with them. Even the indigent children served these creoles without character to feel superior, to feel fine and illustrious. The idea that poverty is the problem of the poor found its way very easily in these lands of God. From then on the powerful felt that they were sufficiently doing their duty if they devoted a fraction of their wealth to charity. But the state existed from the beginning to defend privileges, 
and despite proclaiming its republican and revolutionary roots with bugles, it was already that two-faced monstrosity that it would continue to be for centuries. He had a face to serve the powerful, made of deference and servility, and another, made of arrogance and ferocity, to dispatch the poor. The sensible castes of other nations understood that to allow misery to spread is to fuel an extreme danger. Poverty is not a problem for the poor, it is a problem for all of society, and Bernard Shaw said many decades ago that to allow misery to exist is to allow the entire society to be corrupted. That insensitivity, that selfishness, that lack of commitment to others will not charge us in hell, they are charging us here, on earth. By allowing there to be miserable, helpless beings who grow in hunger, in indignity, and in uncertainty, everything else is ruined. It's not that the poor can't live in this country, it's that the rich can't live either. To allow extreme poverty to exist is to make the fences grow around the residences, the locks multiply, and an army of private security guards is necessary, it is to make the children no longer able to go to school in peace, that they cannot confidently go out to the parks. The resounding stupidity of the owners of the country has finally meant that they cannot be the owners of the country either, that the streets are no man's land, that we all feel sitting on a powder keg. Now, at last, those who have always profited from national miseries, those who even made their business out of the poverty of others, begin to feel that something stinks in Denmark and rush to look, as always, for the culprit. They will take time to understand, like Oedipus, who is responsible for the plagues in Thebes. An incredible stupidity made it so that nobody can finally enjoy what they have, and the country of selfishness, pettiness and exclusion devours itself while wondering why, if we all dream of happiness and prosperity, we all we see ourselves sunk in uncertainty and drowned by evil. So we get agitated pointing out the evil outside of us, in the lack of values of others, in the loss of republican virtues by the rest, in a satanic conspiracy of evildoers, because we are not capable of looking at our hearts. Chesterton said that the good does not consist simply in refraining from doing evil, that the good cannot be a merely negative and passive virtue, that the good must be something that works, something perceptible by its fruits, just as white is a color and not a simple absence of color. That is why I said at the beginning that the worst of Columbia's ills is not what is seen but what is not seen. The immense excluded people who do not express themselves, or who have so completely lost confidence that they prefer to withdraw into personal life, living on the margins of the corrupt and hostile state, trying to save themselves, as best they can, and dedicated to the task at the same time precarious and heroic to search for subsistence in a fight of all against all, because no collective purpose can be vindicated, because no one can feel worthy and proud part of a nation. This is understandable to the extent that the national rhetoric debased all the language of the great causes, wasted all those enormous words, those illustrious abstractions, until turning them into symbols of treason and imposture. I sincerely believe that after Jorge Elier Gaetan, no politician has spoken words that truly establish a community, bonds of solidarity among Colombians. Since then, Colombia continues to dismiss its hopes in cemeteries and now, as a high symbol of the time, does not believe in anything. The picture that Colombia offers us today, intimidated by itself, cornered by itself, sunk in a knot of cruel and sterile wars, where all those who obtain some benefit close their eyes and tell themselves again that it is only for now, that the storm will pass, that confused picture could be described by these verses of W.B. Yeats, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yes, the problem with Colombia is the inability to react, the loss of trust, the loss of hope, the overwhelming lack of character that makes us make the mistake of reaching out to the society we have and instead of acknowledging it, let's close the eyes, denying ourselves the difficult but promising transformation that history is demanding of us. Only when the great multitudes of this country, including the leading sectors that are capable of changing their foolishness for something more intelligent and more practical, are filled with the conviction that the country would be better if we stopped imposed tours, simulations, and exclusions, only when the dejected and distrustful country is filled with the passionate intensity that today only those who live from war and chaos have, 
will we become worthy of a different destiny, and will we be able to change this chorus of useless complaints that is heard everywhere, for something happier and more fruitful? We would like public telephones to be used to make calls, that the means of transport work, that the highways serve to be transit, that they be correctly signposted so that the most elementary trip does not cost us so much work, that the technology we use consult the country in which it is applied, and thus the roads do not sink because of this or crack because of that, that the products of our nature be known and used in a reasonable way, that we do not allow other peoples and other prejudices to dictate how we manage our wealth, let justice work. But for this it is necessary to know how we are and what we can commit to in a social contract. We have been disobeying perfect codes for centuries, transgressing admirable regulations and boasting of the perfection of institutions that no one respects. We would like the bridges not to fall. That the armed forces serve to defend the life, honor and property of citizens. That we really had the right to work. That work, as Jorge Elier Gaetan wanted, was as highly valued among us as in those peoples we admire so much and from whom we learn so little by giving ourselves only to vain simulation. We would like to live in a country of dignified people, where poverty does not mean social contempt or moral misery, where the state strives to dignify the population, where the police have something better for the poor than clubs and learn to be the servants of the community, instead of the arbitrary powers that they are now forced to be. We would like to find worthy and serene peoples throughout the incomparable national geography, that the best that we are emerges in our faces, that nobility, that hospitality, that familiarity that always characterized our peasant towns and that still encourage under the tensions and violence of modernity, do not die. We would like to see the railways, the shipyards, the ports, see the coastlines favored by a truly national and truly respectful state. And we would like the Colombian state, which has already forced the nation not only to live without incentives and without protection, but also to live in spite of its institutions, to become a state that is minimally effective in basic matters of public interest that concerned, would cease to be an instrument to defend privileges and guarantee inequalities, and would give us, as Borges wanted of every state, a severe minimum of government. In Colombia today it is not about building an infinitely powerful, interventionist and annoying state, since society has fortunately learned to live without it, but about dismantling the iniquity of an anti-popular and abusive state, changing it for a simple but respectable administration and active, that serves society to unfold its possibilities and to face the rich and unruly nature that has corresponded to us. A state that finally resembles the country, and that is directed by a national will. But for that to happen, the state of privileges, simulations and impostures, the state of corruption and looting, of insensitivity and disrespect for the citizen must disappear absolutely and does not deserve the slightest consideration. Its officials, its authorities and its politicians are just the product of the bad habits of a long history, they are not the cause but the consequence of the state that exists, just as the state is the consequence of the society that we are and that must change if we want to survive. Thus, it is clear to me that it is not the state that can change society, but on the contrary, society that must change the state, not only its administration and officials, but also its structure and logic. But for this, society itself must become another, and only from non-state social initiative can that new society come out, whose foundation is the moral seed that is in everyone, and the dissatisfaction and boredom that the entire society already feels. Colombia today is a country where the poor cannot eat, the middle class cannot buy and the rich cannot sleep. Only by changing our way of being together, only by summoning the dignity of millions of beings and urging them to be the country, its face, its spokespersons, and its purposes, only by finally giving their place in history to the majority excluded and degraded by amazing arrogance, we can look forward to a country where it is once again a source of pride and greatness to live and die. What modern societies teach us is that we are all in the hands of everyone. For how long will the privileged resign themselves to paying for their privileges with anxiety, advancing through the avenues between clouds of bodyguards, just because the country in which they were born has ceased to be a homeland and has bristled with enemies? 
How long will it take them to understand that something is wrong with the social order if the elderly cannot walk calmly through the parks, if the accidental disappearance of a child in a shopping center produces an indescribable horror? Our world has become rarefied, but how can we be surprised if its history has been a growing process of expropriation, not only of material assets but of the dignity and the very human condition of legions and legions of beings? If the officials of the state commit crimes, if the trustees of public faith loot the treasure, if those in charge of defending the law and watching over His Majesty do not feel subject to it and violate it at will, how can we demand that they be behave like citizens those who grow up in abandonment, formed in bitterness and resentment, those who have nothing to thank society for, those who do not expect anything from it? It is easy to unleash censure and disapproval, but a decent country is no longer something that is owed to us for justice, but rather something that we have to deserve for our actions. As a friend recently told me, starting from scratch would be easier. If the task were to change the government, or change the officials, or change the state, everything would be relatively easy. It would be a problem of electoral campaigns, or of moralizing campaigns, or at most of great constitutional changes. But what is required is something broader and at the same time more subtle, it is to change that mode of our being that is the substratum on which all the disorder of our nation rests. And the main legacy of our being Colombian has to do with what most clearly typifies us from the beginning. The most urgent task of humanity in general is the task of recognizing oneself in the other, the task of assuming difference as a wealth, the task of learning to relate to others without requiring them to bend to what we are or assume our truth. In the face of the fascisms that are resurfacing today in so many places on the planet, this urgency arises to ensure that the diversity on which life itself depends persists in the world. The triumph of a single model, of a single path, of a single truth, of a single aesthetic, of a single language, is as great a threat as the triumph of a single species or in the plant kingdom would be in the animal kingdom. The triumph of a single tree or a single fern. In this defense of diversity, there is room for the struggle for the existence of many different nations, with their different languages, with their cultures, with their clothing, with their gods and, if you will, with their prejudices. And so the danger of hegemony and imperialism is better seen. During the Boer War in South Africa at the turn of the century, Chesterton declared himself a supporter of South African nationalists in the name of English nationalism. Accused of treason, he replied, I am a nationalist. Being a nationalist is not only loving one's own nation but accepting that others have theirs. Being an imperialist, on the other hand, is in the name of one's own nation wanting to take their nation away from others. It is in this struggle for the recognition of the other and respect for him that the unique task of Colombians is inscribed in our time. Because like many modern countries and perhaps a little more, Colombia is par excellence the country of the other. And all his misfortune has consisted in the inability to recognize himself in the other because the other is always different, he is not the brother, nor the member of the ethnic group, nor the member of the tribe, nor the co-religionist, nor the member of the same social class, or the same party. Each Colombian is the other, the different, what is not confused with me. This extreme individuality is the fruit of all the tensions of the West condensed in a single territory. Of the clash between Europe and America, of the clash between whites and Indians, of the clash between Catholics and pagans, of the clash between masters and slaves, of the clash between metropolises and colonies, of the clash between barbarism and civilization, and the impossibility of knowing which is which, of the clash between the peninsulars and the creoles, of the clash between the capital and the province, of the clash between the city dwellers and the mountains, of the clash between the rich and the poor, of the clash between the educated and the ignorant, of the clash between officials and individuals, of the clash between Caribbeans and Andeans, of the clash between those who are people and those who are not, of the clash between federalists and centralists, of the clash between the traditionalists and the radicals, of the clash between the Camandularos and the Kumkuras, of the clash between the liberals and the conservatives, of the clash between the bandits and the good people.
of the clash between the armed forces and the subversives, of the long and reciprocal disqualifications between all these groups that hate and deny each other, without knowing that they are nothing more than the heirs and the perpetuators of an ancient curse, in the country of inherited hatreds and the pedagogies of intolerance and resentment. Every Colombian is the other, and will have to fight against his own heart to be a little more generous, a little more tolerant, a little more friendly, a little more hospitable. If we don't, we will continue to be the melancholy country where being intelligent consists of being clever, that is, capable of deceiving the other without scruples, where to be noble is to be an idiot, where to differ from the others is to arouse the chorus of gossip, and where a kind of dark and crouching fascism continues to feed on hatred and exclusion. Borges speaks of the hydrographers who affirmed that a single ruby is enough to divert the course of a river. One thing would suffice for Colombia to change to the unimaginable. It would be enough for each Colombian to become capable of accepting the other, to accept the dignity of what is different, and to feel capable of respecting what is not like him. That is the change at once vast and subtle that I was talking about. That is perhaps the only revolution that Colombia needs. Finish. What is missing in Colombia? William Ospina